Yeah, okay. Well, good to see you all. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, yesterday was a beautiful summer's day, and it's almost like that today, isn't it? Uh, lovely to see you all, and thank you for coming. We're going to read just a, a verse or two from the Bible to set the scene uh, for this morning. Now, brothers, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, I want to remind you of the gospel. I preach to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. The very simple way of describing the gospel and our first two songs really bring together the whole gospel in what we're going to sing. So we're going to start with hymn number 1072, 1072, in Christ alone my hope is found, he is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest, fiercest drought and storm. It really clearly indicates about the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So we're going to stand to sing in Christ alone. Thank you.
Please take your seats. Let's pray, shall we? Our God and Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful privilege that we have the first day of a new week to gather together, to meet in your presence, and to sing your praises. And we thank you for these words, Father, that so often we sing, and yet they're so special. They remind us of the coming of the Lord Jesus, that great event when God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. We thank you, O oh God, for his life here on earth, lived to perfection and obedience in all that he said and did. We've been reminded, too, that his footsteps led to a cross. And there on that cross, he took our sins. Father, we've been reminded Christ died for our sins. And we thank you for all those here this morning who can say, yes, he died for me. I know that he died for my sins. He was wounded for me. And we give thanks, Father God, that it wasn't just the cross, but he rose from the dead triumphantly. And we've been singing, and as he stands in victory, death has been conquered, Satan has been overcome, new life has been given to all those who will trust in him. And we thank you for that this morning. We thank you, too, that we have a destiny in his hands. And once we're in his hands, no one can pluck us from his hands. Father, we come and bring our praise this morning and our worship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And we're going to stand again to sing 720, uh, which again summarizes the gospel. We believe in God the Father. And uh, we're going to follow the words carefully as we read them and sing them together. Thank you. There we are. Brilliant. We'll start again. Thank you.
Thank you. Please be seated. We have a Bible reading this morning, and it's Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. So when I was with you in the spring, it was Proverbs chapter 3, and then I think you've been looking at other passages of Scripture. Now you're back in Proverbs. So I don't know where we'll be when I come back next spring. But um, there's 30 chapters, or 31 chapters in Proverbs, so maybe we'll still be in Proverbs with me. But it's, it's a pretty tough chapter. It's chapter 9, but it's the Word of God. So I read it and follow it if you have a Bible from verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maids, and she calls from the highest point of the day, let all who are simple come in here. She says to those who lack judgment, come eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of understanding. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insult. Whoever rebukes a wicked man incurs abuse. Do not rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Instruct a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will add to his learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through me, I'm sorry, for through me your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. The woman folly is loud. She is undisciplined and without knowledge. She sits at the door of her house and on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by who go straight on that way. Let all who are simple come in here, she says to those who lack judgment. Stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of the grave. And we trust God will add his blessing to that reading of his own precious word. Well, it's a great thrill this morning for me to see so many boys and girls. It's often that uh, I go to a church and there's nobody well, younger than me, let alone down to children's age. But um, it's lovely to see you all. Thank you for coming this morning, getting up early and coming to church. Well, here we are. We're going to tell you a story about a man called Nathan. Nathan was a carpenter. He worked really hard. And at the end of every week, 
The man who he worked for gave him his wages. And what he used to do was this. He gave some of his wages to his mum and dad because he lived with them. And he went to a wall in his house and he pulled out a brick. And there was a hole in the wall. And he put his spare money in that secret hiding place in the wall, put the brick, brick back. And this happened every week. He worked hard, he earned his wages, he gave money to his mum and dad, he got the brick out, and he put money into that hole. And this happened for several weeks, maybe even months. Until Nathan thought, I'll see how much I've saved up. And he got out all the money and he put it on a table and he counted it and he thought, I think I've got enough. So he went to the market. And when he went to the market, he went around all the stores and he suddenly saw what he was looking for. And he said to the lady in charge of the store, how much is that? And she told him. And Nathan said, oh dear, I don't know if I've got enough. So uh, he said, I'm not sure I've got enough. And she said, well, how much have you got, Nathan? So Nathan put all his money on her desk and she counted it and she said, sorry, Nathan, there's not enough. Oh dear, he thought, I've worked so hard, I've saved so hard, surely it... And she said, all right, Nathan, I'll let you have it. You can take it away and you can take it away because you have got and paid with everything you had for it. So he took it away. And you're thinking to yourself, what on earth was it that Nathan saved for so much and uh, eventually bought it. And to help me, I really need a young lady. Is there a young lady who would like to come and help me? Is everybody too scared of me? I won't. Yeah. Are you suggesting your daughter will come? Come on then. <laughs> this could be a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> Because we're going to pretend that you're going to get married. And what Nathan had actually bought was this. And uh, it goes on her head just like that. When we were getting married, I went to a jeweler's and I bought a ring. But in those days, they didn't do rings. They did headdresses with all these little coins on. And that would go under Kathy's um, neck like that. And she would walk down the town <laughs> wearing that, and everybody would say, look at her, she's just got married. Look at that headdress. She'd be so proud, she would stand straight, and everybody would look, and she'd be so, so thrilled with her headdress. End of embarrassment. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> I hope you find the right bloke. Well, here she is. Look how she looks. She's called Miriam. She's got her headdress on. You can see her silver coins. She's just got married, and she is so, so happy. What a lovely thing it was for her husband to give everything he had to buy the headdress. One day, as she puts on her headdress, she's going down the market. She looks. There's something missing. Maybe I haven't counted right, she thought. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine? There's supposed to be ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's only nine. Oh dear, she thinks, what's going to happen? If Nathan comes home and he realizes that I haven't got my headdress properly, he's going to be so upset. He's going to be really upset and he's going to say, I bought you that headdress, it cost everything I had, you haven't looked after it. Um, one of the coins is missing. She thought to herself, I've got to find it. I've got to find it as quickly as I can because I must find it before Nathan comes home. Some words to remember. The words begin with the letter L. That coin, her silver coin, unfortunately, what's the first word? It was lost. It was lost, wasn't it? And unfortunately, this coin was quite... Anybody got that word? Yeah? Sm small or L? Little, thank you. And to her, 
It meant something special. I'm pointing to my heart because she, she certainly did. She loved it. Let's go back. Let's go it now. Lost, little, and loved. Well, she's got to look for it. Where is it, she thought. Now, I don't know how it is in your house, but it certainly is in hers. Where's my car keys? Where's the phone? I can't find this. I can't find that. And uh, I know what it's like when you're going to school. Where's my... I got one shoe, Mum, but where's the other one? I can't find it. I've lost this. I've lost that. I've lost the other. Well, she was like that, accepting... Our house is like most people's, we've got several rooms. So you've sometimes got to look through lots of rooms to find what you've lost. Her house was small. It wasn't much bigger than this platform up here. Over here she had her cooking pot, where she did her cooking. She had spare pots over there. This is where she ate her dinner. This is where she lay down for rest. She had a bed here or some mats on the floor. It was a small house. She's looking everywhere for it. She can't find it. She gets out a brush. When I was in Africa, and I was with somebody in a, a minibus, and somebody banged on the window when we were at a halt sign, and was waving this, and I thought, I've got to have that. So I put down the, wind screen, the window and said, how much? And I paid the money, because I had seen children in their classroom, in their school, in Burkina Faso, actually doing a cleaning. In your school, you've got cleaners who come, in that school, they had to do their own cleaning with a brush like that. And I think she didn't perhaps have a long brush like that. I think she was here. Is it over here where I do my cooking? Is it over here by my cooking pots? Is it over here where, where, where we sit and have our meal? Is it over here where we were at bedtime? I can't find it anywhere. And she was looking, and she's looking. And uh, she's on the floor even. You can see it wasn't easy to find it. In fact, it gets quite dark, and still, she hasn't found it. So, she gets out a lamp, and her lamp would be something a bit like this. You put oil in there, you have a little wick there, you can see she's lit the lamp, and it looks better there, you can see how she's looking. Is it up here? Or is it down here? Wherever is it? I've looked and I've looked and I've looked, and uh, eventually, she looks, and you can just see, if you look carefully, just peeping out under the carpet. There it is. My, she's so excited. I found what was lost, she says. I am so, so pleased. And uh, she was really delighted. I think we could have some other words. She lights a lamp, she looks for it, and she keeps on looking until she found it, and then, she went round to her neighbour and she said, guess what happened this morning? I lost one of my silver coins. You better find that quickly, she said. Otherwise, when Nathan comes home, he'll be really upset. You must find it quickly. And um, she said, well, I have found it, but it's got a little hole in it. You've got to sew it onto the headdress and I'm not much good at sewing. Can you sew it on for me? Of course I can, she said. And off she went to sew on her headdress. And eventually it was all done. And she and her friends had a great big, on your birthday, at Christmas, we'll probably have a party, won't we? You were going to say that for me, weren't you? Yes, they had a party. And when Jesus told that, he said, well, there's lots of things we can learn from that, but this is what I particularly want us to remember. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And I think it really was Jesus saying, just like that little coin was special to the lady, special to Nathan because he'd spent so much on it, we are all, every single one of us, the oldest person in the room, the youngest person in the room, we're all very, very special indeed. Whatever our families, whatever, whoever we belong to, we're all special. We are special to everyone, but especially we are special to mum and dad, yeah? Grand and granddad, maybe. Auntie and uncle, maybe. Brothers and sisters, maybe. But special I've got one word, it's got three letters. 
Jesus or God, exactly. God loves every one of us, and we are all special to God. We are all special to God. How important it is to learn that lesson. It's a very simple lesson, and sometimes people say, nobody loves me, nobody wants me. They get a little bit upset because they don't feel anybody cares. God always cares for us. We are special to God, and everybody is special to us. Boys and girls, I wish you were in the school where I go sometimes because you have sat brilliantly. And do you know what? Can I tell you this? These three guys listened completely all the time. <laughs> they did ever so well, didn't they? Well done. Because we're all young at heart and we all enjoy a good story, don't we? Well, it's my turn to sit down. Is it your turn now? Hello, and um, it's time once again. Um, so we've been collecting items for the Christmas shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, and we are nearly at the end. Um, we pack them next month, but there'll be more about that in a minute. Um, so in September, we have been collecting items for girls like hair accessories and things and bags and so we collected 42 bags, four sunglasses, 17 hairbands, four hair sets like with hair clips and things and 582 hair rubbles. <laughs> so I think that's the most we collected all year so, so thank you to everyone who's collected for them this month. Um, so throughout the year we've been collecting various things and there's a few things up there on the screen that we've been collecting. Um, we collected clothing in January, cuddly toys in February, um, hygiene items in March and April, toys in May and June, stationery in July and August and hair accessories in September. So we have pretty much covered everything that we need to get. We are still short of a few things. So this month, we are going to be collecting, there's five different things we are need at the moment. So um, if you can, it would be great if you could collect some um, coloring pencils, some rulers, pencil cases, um, rubbers, and um, toothbrushes, but especially younger children's toothbrushes. And those are the things that we need a few more of, so if you can collect them, that would be great. Um, I thought we might just remind ourselves with a short video of why we collect horseshoe boxes. The war still goes on, and uh, we are all tired. Uh, we are all tired, going through a difficult time. We are strong in our faith, but without resources, we cannot bring victory to our country. Так, ми приїхали, ми в Качі, де нас зустрічають. We're here for Operation Christmas Child right now. This year we've given out the 200 millionth shoe box in 30 years, 200 million boxes. It's hard to fathom 200 million. But it's something God has done. Every box is important. The 200 millionth is not any more important than the person who gave the first box. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, being able to be on the other side, to be able to pack a shoebox and being able to deliver a shoebox to children in Ukraine, it's just an absolute privilege. This country has suffered incredibly. And it's, it's still suffering. These children, this is just a chance to, to put the war behind them for a few minutes, for an hour or so, and it gives us a chance just to love them. At this time, people's hearts really soften. They are looking for hope. They are looking for 
future, something good has to be in this world among all of the atrocities people go through. When the gospel was presented, I prayed that their hearts were opened and the seeds of gospel were planted in those hearts. I know that they felt love today. I know that they felt the hope and love of Jesus. In the midst of war, we know that He is a powerful, He is bigger than all of this. And the fact that Operation Christmas Child is able to come into this country and continue to deliver the gospel, is, it's incredible. It just shows you how amazing our God is. So that was Ukraine, um, where the church's shoeboxes got sent last year. Um, probably not those particular ones, but so that's one of the places they may get sent to. Um, just a heads up, next month we are sending the shoeboxes, so they need to get packed. So the 4th of November um, is the date that the, we've got the church available mm -hmm. that we'll be packing the boxes. So if you're interested in that, you, and there'll be more details in a couple of weeks, but if you can remember the 4th of November here at the church, uh, there'll be some flyers and some flyers about what we're collecting this month. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I have a friend in um, the western part of Romania, uh, the Hungarian part. Uh, they live in a place called Oradia, uh, Chubby and Enrico. And they do a lot of work amongst deprived and very poor children. And they do shoeboxes, of course, but they can only give out what they receive. And they've told us many times, we never, ever have enough. There are so many poor families in our part of the world. And um, they say, what we have to do sometimes is try and get some more boxes. And if we've got some money, we fill them ourselves. If we haven't got any money, uh, then we have to split what's in the other boxes and share it out amongst others so that everybody has something. But you can see the need. And all that is a tremendous work not only in um, Romania and Europe, but in other parts of the world as well, where there is tremendous need. So we're going to go on now to just do another bit of overseas work, if you like, and um, just a little update of some of the things that I'm involved in. Most of you know that we still go to school. Um, I'm the oldest person in any school wherever I go, and frequently there are teachers there who say, Mr. Gillam, I remember when you came to my school when I was a little girl 30 years ago or something like that. Um, it's great to be remembered. I just trust and pray that as we go from time to time to the 12 schools in our immediate area, not only will they remember me, but they'll remember what I told them. And that's so important, isn't it? So do pray for the school's work and continuing opportunities that we have to speak to crowds of children. I'll be in uh, two different schools uh, tomorrow, God willing. Um, the other thing that we do is the Postal Bible School. We have just sent out in October uh, lessons to about 280 children spread all over the country. Some of them go to a Sunday school. Some of them don't. Some of them do our lessons because they haven't got a Sunday school that they can go to. Uh, some of them uh, we don't know much about at all, uh, but we do know that they want to study God's Word with Bible time lessons. And so we send them out uh, every month to these 280 children. But um, it's going to be a quite difficult. Uh, we've had somebody work with us, Grace. She's worked with us for uh, 25 years. Uh, she does a day a week for postal Bible school, a day a week for Bible education services, a day a week sorting out me. Um, to work with me for 25 years, she deserves a gold medal, there's no doubt about it. I'm not an easy person to work with, she will tell you that, I'm quite sure. But she's retiring, her birthday is the end of the month, and at long last, after waiting, as the government have made it possible, she's getting her pension. So she said, Christmas, I'm finishing. So we're not quite sure how the Bible, postal Bible school work is going to go in the future, you might pray about that but also BES, of course. I thought I'd just take you to one country where there is a particular need, and that is Ethiopia. I love Ethiopia. I've been there four times, and I'd go tomorrow if I had the opportunity to go. It's a very special place. Capital is Addis Ababa, very busy city. Looks like that a bit. 
crowds of people there. I think there's something like 12 million people in Addis Ababa alone. And we were in one of their classrooms years ago, and they said, we need Bible resources to teach children something about the Bible. Uh, but they can't understand English, of course. The lady, the teacher, she told us how important it was, but she could only speak only a little bit of English. So we had to translate our lessons into Homeric. There are three years of lessons at four different levels. We've done about half of them. It is very, very difficult to get people who can speak English fluently and also speak Homeric. So progress has been very, very slow indeed. As I say, we've done about half of it, and the children have been using the booklets, but they keep on saying, we want some more, so we need to do a bit more translation. And uh, there's a, one of the Amharic booklets. But there's a bit of a problem in Ethiopia because um, half the country don't speak Amharic, they speak Oromo. And if you hear about troubles in Ethiopia, it is because the Amharic people are not getting on very well with the Oromo people. And there's almost like a sort of civil war in parts of uh, Ethiopia are really not safe to go. So we had to start translating into a Romo. And eventually we got a little bit there, but we've only done about one sixth of the translation of the three year syllabus. And finding somebody who is fluent in English and a Romo, there's not many of them about. And that uh, we have really had difficulty in finding translators and proofreaders. But we've managed. The guy who has just been in this country, a great friend of ours, Mulangeta Askari, he is an evangelist. And he's got this vision of reaching the children of Ethiopia. And uh, he does that by using our materials whenever he can. So he says, come on, send us more, send us more, send us more, because we've got more children and we want to teach them the word of God. I was out there uh, just before COVID doing some training and... Um, We've also got another friend there called Tadesi Landibo, great man. He would give anything to reach children. And he says, we've run out of booklets. We want some more. Please send some more. So you might pray for Ethiopia. Pray for the translators. Uh, pray also for uh, those who are printing so that the material can be used by children. Again, they have shoeboxes out there because there's tremendous need and when we went into Tessie's home some years ago, we were absolutely staggered how poor he was and how difficult it was for living. We have so much, haven't we? We can give to others in any way that we possibly can. We're going to sing again, and it's this time 733. 733. We praise you, we bless you, our Saviour divine. All power and dominion forever be thine. We sing of thy mercy with joyful acclaim, for thou hast redeemed us. All praise to thy name. I will stand again to sing, We praise thee, we bless thee.
Please be seated. I don't know at what stage the children go. Now's the time. Boys and girls, off you go. Great. We're going to pray. I think all of us have been shocked, haven't we, by that uh, situation in the Middle East. Uh, so we'll pray about that and other troubled spots of the world. Uh, we've been reminded of Ukraine, and it was another terrible week for the people in Ukraine this week as well. So there's much to pray for. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you that we can come to you. The Word of God reminds us that we can come boldly to the throne of grace where we can find grace to help in time of need. And Father God, we do ask that you will hear these prayers that we bring to you to the very throne of grace. And we pray about the situation in Israel. So many have lost loved ones over the last 24 hours, both in the Gaza Strip and in Israel itself. And we pray for families that are mourning. We pray that they might find comfort alone in yourself, that they might turn to you. But most of all, Father, we pray that somehow or other, the authorities will get together and there will be peace and there will be no more bloodshed and uh, no more hostility. We know how difficult the situation is and it sometimes gets so bad and so difficult. But we pray, Lord, that, that there might be peace in that country as we have been taught in your word to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so we pray for that situation. We think too of other countries where there's problems and we think of the situation in Ukraine. Again, many have lost loved ones during this past week. And we pray, Lord, in that country where there has been over the years a great work for you, that there will be those who will comfort and bring a message of hope through the Lord Jesus to uh, people who are mourning and who are going through such difficult times. And we think, too, of the um, uh, earthquake in Morocco, the earthquake in Turkey. Uh, we think, too, of the floods in Libya. Uh, we remember, too, the problems ongoing in Myanmar and so many other troubled parts of the world. Maybe we don't even hear about them sometimes. But, Lord, we pray for them this morning. We thank you that we have the confidence that you're in overall control. And we pray, Lord, that you will intervene, that it might be peace, that your people might be protected, that they might have the liberty that we enjoy to move forward in our service and life for you. Lord, we pray that you will speak into these situations and move in these situations as we remember them. And pray for your people who seek to serve you faithfully in these difficult and difficult areas. So we ask for your help this morning as we may soon turn to your word. Pray that you'll guide us by your spirit into truth. Pray that we might know the reality of you speaking to us. And we pray, Lord, for the children. Thank you for so many boys and girls who are in the Sunday school this morning in junior church. We pray for them. Pray for those who are teaching them. And pray you'll give all the help that's needed uh, with the boys and girls this morning as the seed of the word of God is sown in their young hearts. So we just ask for your help. Pray for our, your blessing and we return our thanks for all that we have in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. It's 1209, 1209. Uh, my heart is filled with thankfulness. And um, we're going to sing those words of that more modern song that just helps us to pause and think of God's goodness to us. My heart is filled with thankfulness. Um, it's crashed again. Good job I don't crash, isn't it? <laughs> Keep going. Though I'm struggling this morning. Yesterday was such a brilliant morning. I got outside straight after breakfast, did three hours in the garden, and my back is saying, you stupid man. <laughs> so if I sit down for this song, I don't mind if anybody else sits down for the song, or others, if you want to stand up, stand up. But we're going to join in singing, My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. 
Lovely words. Let's join to sing, shall we? Please be seated. I heard something very helpful the other day because wisdom is not an easy thing to understand, uh, neither is knowledge. But this is what I heard You know a crocodile. You know that if you went near to a crocodile, you would be in danger. You knew that if you touched the head of the crocodile, it would probably open his mouth and snap your hand off. We know all these things. That's knowledge. Wisdom is to put that knowledge into practice. And if you see a crocodile, you run for a mile as fast as you can. That's not knowledge. That is wisdom, using the knowledge that you have to be very wise indeed. I expect that most of you um, read Our Daily Bread. If you don't, it's a very useful little booklet with a reading for each day. And yesterday we read from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I thought, well, that's amazing, because in my PowerPoint, I have got Deuteronomy chapter 30 mentioned. And then today we read Proverbs chapter 4. And I thought, why? Here we are in Proverbs again. It's a very special passage. And this morning we read this. That's why we must get wisdom, get understanding. Wisdom teaches us what to do with knowledge. And true wisdom, the wisdom we desperately require, comes from God. Our knowledge always falls short. But his wisdom provides what we need. And that's why we're thinking about wisdom and knowledge again this morning. So, last time I came in the spring, I gave you this fact file, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, the main place in the Old Testament for practical teaching about how to live. In fact, one book calls it God's Blueprint for Our Life and Our Conduct. Our conduct. And in fact... There's so much here that's practical, that's day-by-day -day sensibility as to how we should live and what we should do. And the key verse, of course, is chapter 9 and verse 10, which we read, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Comes from chapter 1, of course, as well. 
And chapters 1 and 9 contain teaching about wisdom. We think there are probably something like 13 lessons about wisdom. And when we get to chapter 9, it's the final lesson about wisdom. You won't be hearing much more about wisdom if you carry on going through um, the book of Proverbs. Chapters 1 to 9, the teaching about wisdom. Chapters 10 and 22, sorry, I moved on a little bit too quick. Chapters 10 to 22, the Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, there are also other Proverbs as well. Solomon wrote some, we know. And uh, the next chapter begins about Solomon and what he said, the Proverbs of Solomon. So that's Proverbs in a nutshell. And uh, as we look at it this morning, we realize that this is the invitation, this is what the NIV uh, has a title for the chapter, Invitations of Wisdom and Folly. Or putting it very simply, it is the call to live. That's what chapter 9 is all about. And there's the invitation for wisdom and the invitation for folly and how people respond to that. The summary of 13 lessons, as I've said, in chapters 1 to 8. So we come to the first invitation. And the first six verses, I've called it the invitation to wisdom. And there's a sort of pictorial way of doing this. Wisdom is shown to be found in a house at the beginning of the chapter. Foolishness, folly or stupidity is found in a house at the end of the chapter. So there's a contrast between a house at the beginning and a house at the end. The house at the beginning is in fact run by a lady who perhaps some books call her Lady Wisdom. Lady Wisdom. And this is her house. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven pillars. It was some house. So somebody has said, well, what are these seven pillars that the writer mentions in this verse? Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven pillars. Martin and I were reminiscing just before we had prayer before the service about our trip to Jordan. And uh, we were talking about the desert uh, down in the southern part of Jordan, which they call Wadi Rum, uh, which is probably the area where Lawrence of Arabia uh, operated. Some of you may have even seen the film of Lawrence of Arabia, a great film, one of the sort of classics of films, isn't it? And Lawrence Arabia wrote a book which he called The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. And um, I thought to myself, well, I'm interested in Jordan. I've seen the film, Lawrence of Arabia. I'll read The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. And when I got to reading it, I had not the faintest idea what it was about. Yeah. I couldn't understand a word of it, hardly. And uh, it was very, very difficult to understand. And when I read chapter 9 of uh, Proverbs, I felt almost the same. What on earth is all this about? What can I say that might be helpful? And the more you get into it, of course, there's lots to be found here. But interestingly enough, somebody has said, actually, you need to go to the New Testament to find the seven pillars of wisdom. Because this is what James says in chapter 3 and verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Seven characteristics that come from wisdom. So if you want to find out what the seven pillars of wisdom are, James chapter 3 and 17 has got them all. I may give you seven other pillars as we get down the chapter a bit later on this morning. But some people have said, actually, it's nothing to do with pillars in the sense of pillars of wisdom. It's just a very, very special house. It's a prominent house. It's got big columns or big pillars. 
And you've all seen stately homes that uh, have been built over the centuries in our own country. And uh, some of them have got the, the Gothic pillars that come from Roman times or Greek times. And uh, they look very spectacular. Maybe this house was a very big house, a very special house to accommodate all who could come. And so the invitation goes out for people to come to this house, to come to a feast. She's prepared meat, mixed wine, and to set the table. And then people hear the invitation. And the invitation goes out from the highest point of the city, that all who are simple come here. She says, to those who lack judgment, come and eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. There's an invitation for people to come to find wisdom. And that's a picture, a way of putting it, in a big house with a big feast, with a big invitation to come. But actually, the truth has to be more of a practical challenge. The way that we find wisdom, first of all, is verse 6, where it says, um, House of St. Peter's, the feast, the invitation. In verse 6, it tells us this, leave your simple ways, uh, leave your simple ways, and then you will learn to walk in the way of understanding. To find true wisdom, we leave the ordinary, the human, and we find from God, because if a man lacks wisdom, he must ask of God, we find in God the way of understanding. Understanding is mentioned 25 times in Proverbs, and it's a very clear understanding of how you can find real wisdom and real understanding. And so this is a picture of it in chapter 9. It's almost like going into a house where everything is prepared for you. You find wisdom. You respond to the invitation to find wisdom there. And in a practical way, it's coming to God and finding wisdom that he alone has. And when we come to him, we will find the important wisdom that we need. The Lord Jesus told a story that was very similar, of course. Uh, he said a man prepared a banquet and people uh, were invited to the banquet. And apparently it was always a double invitation in those days. The invitation went out and you were supposed to respond and say, well, I'll come. And then when it was almost ready to eat, the invitation went out again so that people came and responded the second time because they promised to come at the first invitation. And that gave the people who were organizing the meal, the banquet, opportunity to prepare enough food because they knew roughly how many were coming. And then, of course, when the invitation went out the second time, uh, somebody said, well, actually, um, I've bought a field, so I can't come. I've got to look at the field. And somebody said, I've actually bought a new pair of oxen. I must go and try them in my field and do a bit of plowing. And somebody said, well, I've married a wife, well, therefore I can't come. I won't be allowed to come, almost the implication is. They began to make excuses. How many people in their lives, I don't dare use the word simple, but it means very little understanding, very little knowledge, have said, I'm not prepared to come to God. I'm not prepared to come to Jesus. I've got excuses. I don't understand. I can't really live the life that Jesus expects. So many people got excuses. And those excuses always end in disaster. We have to be prepared to give up the old, to come to the new, to give up the past, to come to the future, and walk in the way of understanding. It's a choice that we have to make, isn't it? And that choice is very, very important indeed. Recently, I've been giving quite a lot of teaching about guidance. And I've been quite surprised, really, because I started off by saying, when I was younger, I used to think, well, once you've um, got a partner in life, and you've got a home, and you've got a job, and you've got a church, you don't really need much more guidance. Everything's sorted. And then I said, but actually, I've discovered that is not true at all. And the older you get, 
the more problems you have to face and the more guidance you need. Is our house too big? Shall we move into a smaller house? Shall we move near the family or shall we stay in the place where we've got all our friends? Shall we put somebody who's very old into a home or shall we not because shall we try and look after them? So many decisions. And I was quite impressed by several people who came to me on one occasion after I'd been speaking about guidance. They were all old and they said, what you said was just what I needed to hear. I am finding it so difficult to find the right way forward the way of understanding, the way that God wants me to move in my latter years in terms of house, in terms of church, in terms of family, or whatever it may be. Joshua came to the end of his great ministry in the book of Joshua, and he says this, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served before the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose hands and whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Tremendous challenge, isn't it? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you listen to the cry of the wise and seek wisdom from, your, from God? and guidance from him, and understanding, the way of understanding, or will you go the other way? Says Joshua, here I am, and this is the challenge, this is my faith. I will, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Maybe there's somebody here who's not made that choice, and you're still living the life thinking you know best, and thinking you know all the answers. You need the Lord. You need him. He is the one who is described as the power of God and the wisdom of God. And because of that, 1 Corinthians teaches us that he is the one in whom we can find all that we need. Uh, those who become to Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. So giving it a thought here, wisdom is needed in all of our lives and the choices have to be made. Like Joshua, are we prepared to choose and follow the Lord? Or 1 Corinthians 1 that I've just quoted to you. Now the response. And after we've got to verse 6, we then have the responses to the invitation. And there are some people who scoff. They mock at the invitation. And uh, they, they respond by insults, that's verse 7. They respond by abuse, that's verse 7 again. They respond by hatred in verse 8. And they certainly resort in suffering, which comes to us, if you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. People mock. And as I thought about that, my mind went, of course, into the New Testament. And I thought of the Pharisees, the people who were opposed to the Lord Jesus. They mocked, they scoffed, they insulted, they abused, they hated him, they arrested him, they put him on a cross. That's what they did to the Lord Jesus. How sad that was. And yet, of course, that's the truth. That's what scoffers do. They reject Christ completely. And there are loads and loads and loads of people who refuse to have anything to do with the Lord Jesus in their lives from childhood into teenage years, into the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and right through their life. And uh, if you've ever had the misfortune, and I say it quite carefully, to go to a so-called humanist funeral where there's no songs praising God, where there's no reading of scripture, where there's no prayers to God, where there's no hope. It is an absolute and complete disaster. But isn't it wonderful that we can change from that scoffing and we can find in the Lord Jesus real hope, real truth, real future. And then I thought of the cross and I thought of when the people were there at the cross. They insulted, didn't they? The people who passed by, they abused, they mocked, they showed hatred. 
If he is the one he says he is, he can come down from the cross, save himself and save us. There was all these sort of abusive remarks made. They had no understanding of all that was happening when the Lord Jesus was there at the cross, dying for the sins of the whole world. That's one response. It's the response of the mocker, the scoffer. But here's the other one. Number one, the wise people respond with discipline. I read you the verse. It says, rebuke a wise man and he will love you. He responds to that discipline by uh, showing love. People are not very good at that, are they? And um, some people think they know it all, and that they're not easy people to get on with, are they? And some people think, you can't teach me anything. I need to, I, I know it all. I, I can cope with every situation. But the book tells us, chapter 9, wise people, when criticism comes, or when opposition comes in one way or another, discipline comes, they respond with love. That's quite a tall order, isn't it? We don't like criticism, but we can do that. Or instruction is accepted. And this is what it says in, um, in, verse, um, in verse 9. Instruct a wise man, and he will be wiser still. Uh, during the time that I was uh, chairman of governors of the local school, uh, we did a lot of interviewing of teachers. And I remember interviewing one teacher, and after she'd left the room uh, of the interviewing panel, the head teacher said very clearly, I couldn't work with that woman. She thinks she knows it all. And there are people like that, aren't there? But uh, the person who takes God's word in his hand and reads it carefully is the person who finds discipline here, and we respond with love, instruction, and we accept what God says. It's here in his book, written for us. Not to say, I'm scoffing, I'm insulting, I'm abusing that. I take God's word into my heart. It's instruction, it's a real help. And teaching will respond with learning. Teach a righteous man, and he will add to his learning. So it's taking on the word of God again and learning from it. We can't underestimate this book. Uh, Gordon and Penny and Jean and I and a number of other evangelists were up in Bristol two or three weeks ago at an evangelist conference. And um, we were challenged in one way that struck me very forcibly, that we as evangelists, and any Christian, of course, this applies to, should soak themselves in the Word of God. Should soak themselves in the Word of God. When I came in from the garden after three hours of slog, I was not a pretty sight. And I had to get in the bath and the clothes I'd been wearing into the bin. I needed to sort myself out and get rid of all that was past so that I could be clean. And that's what happens when we come to the Word of God. It helps us to get rid of all that's wrong. And we learn so much that helps us to come closer and nearer to God. But then we go a little bit further. And here's the next spot. For, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm on the road to wisdom when I show love and I listen to instruction and I respond to teaching and learning, but when I have a respect for God, the fear of the Lord. It's not being frightened, of course, there's no doubt you've been told, but I like the word respect because I think that just helps us to recognize that this is where it all starts, a deep respect for God. And um, in a world that's so turmoiled, and we thought about that in our prayers this morning, some people say, is there a God? Where is God when, we're needed, when he's needed? Job said that, but God was there. And he's still there, and he continues to be there. And we can have that deep recognition of who he truly is. Fear is the beginning. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Yes, that's another wonderful, great response to wise, to wise wise teaching, and to the wise man. 
knowledge of the understanding, greater respect for the Lord, and deeper knowledge of the Holy One. To know God. And none of us will know that completely, will we? But as we read, as we pray, as we come closer and closer to the Lord, then we understand how important it is to just get to know him and to know him more and more and more. I um, have the, um, uh, from one of our local churches, their Sunday newsletter uh, sent to me by email. And I was reading one of the local churches that sent one last night, and they were quoting a quotation from the former Archbishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle. And J.C. Ryle, in his book, on holiness challenges people. He says, you will never make progress in the Christian life unless you read, you pray, you meet with God's people, you remember the Lord and the Lord's Supper, you live close to him, and then you will grow and develop in the Christian life. And how important that is. Knowledge of the Holy One. And then years will be added to your life, it says. Your life will be full of the rich experience of God's grace. He said, I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And then you will be rewarded. Did you notice there are seven things that here in chapter 9 we've got? Going back over them again very quickly. We start with discipline. We start with instruction. We start with teaching, giving love, acceptance, learning. And then we go to um, fear or respect for the Lord, knowledge, years will be added to your life, you will be rewarded. That's a firm foundation for life, isn't it? And as uh, the introduction of character, the building of character, um, and somebody says, character is the one thing you cannot borrow, lend, or escape. It is you developing in a greater knowledge and understanding of God's will in your lives. That's what we need. We need wisdom, don't we? And as the Lord Jesus said, he that heareth my word and doeth it, or does it, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And of course, that's so important, isn't it? Um, I don't know much about your Hampshire coast, but our coast is quite vulnerable in places, um, down in Dorset and Lyme Regis and West Bay. And in West Dorset, cliff falls are quite common. And nobody with any sense at all would build anything on the cliff top in Lyme Regis or in West Bay or one of those other places along the Chesil Beach because they know that the foundation is not secure and there would soon be disaster. But people are trying to build their lives on folly, on foolishness, on rejection of Jesus, on rejection of an understanding of God. And that brings us to our final house here. And um, it's an invitation to folly. And it gives us impression not of a prudent woman who has an open house inviting people to come and um, have meat and eat and be blessed and find the way of understanding as the first house did. But this house is organized by a woman, and um, some people call her Lady Stupidity, or Lady of Folly. She's loud-mouthed, undisciplined, ignorant, shameless, slovenliness. There seems to be almost a description of a harlot here, as this lady is described. And she just sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. And she says, let all who are simple come in here. Those who lack judgment. I've got stolen water. Food eaten in secret is delicious, she's saying. And as you think about that, this folly, this seduction that she has, this temptation that she's giving. You remember Eve, don't you? Remember how Eve um, actually... She had, to put it in simple words, food eaten in secret. She thought it was delicious, but it resulted in separation from God and being put out of the garden 
all those years ago. And uh, when you think about it, there are so many who have responded to that seduction. And the result is the end of this chapter, the grave and death. Let me give you an example. Abraham and Lot. Abraham says to Lot, we can't live here. There isn't room for all of our herdsmen. We need to separate. We need to go our separate ways. You choose first. Lot looks towards the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he pitched his tent in that direction and eventually moved into Sodom and Gomorrah. And if it hadn't been for the prayers of Abraham, Lot would have lost his life, but the angels got him out of the city before it was destroyed. His wife looked back, you remember, and became a pillar of salt. It was a disastrous, disastrous time in the life of Lot. But why was it wrong? Because he made the wrong choice. He chose Sodom and Gomorrah rather than staying in the land that God had given to the people of God, to Abraham's family. He didn't stay there. He made a wrong choice. And the result of it was death. Uh, he lost his wife. His children, were, his daughters were responsible for incest. He was responsible for tribes that were against Israel for the rest of their days. It was a terrible, terrible time because he listened to folly and he thought about himself and he didn't listen to the word of God and the result was total disaster. What about this man? We all know the story of Samson and uh, God gave him great, great powers and strength. But he got in with Delilah from the Philistines and eventually she persuaded him to tell her the secret of his strength. He had his hair cut. He lost his strength. And uh, you know, he was captured and he pulled his eyes out, didn't they? The Philistines overcame him. Fortunately, uh, he was able to just bring back revenge to them at the end of his life. But uh, he made a wrong choice. And so many have made that wrong choice. When I was coming home from uh, university and um, needing a holiday job, I got a job um, driving an ice cream van for a firm that went around shops delivering ice cream. And I discovered that one of my uh, colleagues at this works was a bloke called Bill. So I found out a little bit about Bill. He said, um, your name's a bit unfamiliar, Gillum. And he said, I used to sit next to a, a fella who was called Gillum uh, when I went to school. And that turned out to be my dad. And he said, you know, your dad, Arthur, he said, he chose one way, and I chose the other. He chose God's way, and I didn't. And poor Bill, sometimes he was so drunk, he just sat in the cab of or slept in the cab of his van and didn't even bother to get home. His life was a total, total mess. He made one choice, and it went wrong. I know after I'd met up with him, and I told Dad about him, and I said, Dad, he used to sit next to you. He made a bad choice, didn't he? And we prayed for that fella, because he was in a real mess in his life, and how he managed to keep his job, I just don't know. It's so easy to make the wrong choice, isn't it? Lot did it. Samson did it. And there are people every day who are making wrong, wrong choices, and how difficult it is when people make those wrong choices. Moses gave Israel the opportunity of making the right choice. This is what he said to them. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go and possess. So he's saying, I give you a choice. It's life or death. It's good or evil. Which are you going to choose? Now, we know that Israel made the bad choice, didn't they? Very often, they followed the gods of the nations, and they went away from God. They made a wrong choice, and so often they were punished in the history of the book, we know, uh, because of what they had done. How easy it is. Samson, Lot, my dad's friend, 
Israel made wrong choices. Choice is quite a common word as I go to schools and um, if I talk about making the right choice, teachers are always very pleased about that because they're talking to children. Some have made the wrong choice. They've done something they shouldn't have done. They had the opportunity of doing the right thing, but they did the wrong thing. They knew the school rules. They broke the school rules and so on and so forth. Choices are so important. But in believers' lives, making the right choice, going the way of understanding, going the way of wisdom, seeking God's help, and he helps us to make the right choices, whatever it is. Let me finish with these words of scripture. Psalm 25, uh, 12 to 15. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. And as I read those words, there are two things that stand out for me. He will instruct them in the way they should choose. And as I make decisions, and Jean makes decisions about how we're going to move into the next year as we have less help and we have to cut down on some of the things we do, making those choices, not our choices, not what people tell us to do, but what God says. He will instruct them in the way they should go. And then it says this. My eyes are ever on the Lord. My eyes are ever on the Lord. One of the things that we hate doing, and we're not very good at it, is if we go somewhere and have a cup of tea and they say, we'll lead you down to the church um, and you just follow me and it'll be easy for us to get to, to, to the church. And some of these people having said this go so fast that we can't keep up with them. And they get to a lights and we think, shall we go through and stop because they've gone through already? And what will happen if they don't wait for us? And we hate doing that. But the Lord doesn't lead like that, does he? Once our eyes are on the Lord, he will take us through life in the way that we should go, the way of understanding. He will instruct us in that way and we can make the right choices. There's a challenge to all Christians this morning from, Psalm, uh, from Proverbs chapter 9. But there's also a challenge to people perhaps in the congregation who don't know the Lord. Make a choice. Today is the chance to come to the Lord, to respond to him, to recognize that your life has been a mess, but you can find in him real faith, real hope, and real satisfaction, a life that means something, the way of understanding, and more than that, a hope in heaven. It's a real challenge, isn't it? But maybe somebody's saying, I'm going to leave the old life. I'm going to new life. I want to follow God in the way that he wants me to go. Read uh, Proverbs 9 again and see how God will speak to you from it and lead you away from the ways of folly into the way of wisdom and understanding. We're going to sing a hymn to conclude our service this morning. And um, it is 813. 813. And uh, I'm going to be dependent on Abby and Rosie on this. I haven't a clue about this one, but uh, I guess somebody else will know it. Um, Christ is the one who calls, the one who loved and came, to whom by right it falls uh, to bear the highest name. And still today our hearts are stirred to hear his word. And guess what? Walk his way. So we stand to sing.
what a great hymn. Let's pray. Father God, as we have been challenged by your word this morning, we pray that we may not only be hearers of the word, but we pray, Lord, that we might indeed be doers. We pray, Lord, that we might know that wisdom that comes from heaven, that is pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. May we know what it is to know the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. Lord, help us in our lives to use the wisdom that you have given to us to know to make the right choices, to follow the way of understanding and to do what you want us to do in, your, your, in our lives. And Lord, if we've never ever made the right choice for you, challenge our hearts this morning, we pray, that we might know what it is to make the right decision and come to the one who alone can give us salvation and eternal life. We thank you for this time together. We pray your blessing as we part. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you to the musicians. That was great to have that help. And thank you to the back. Two crashes and we still made it. Brilliant. Well done. Thank you ever so much. God bless you all.